What's up guys, today we're going to be going over Bitcoin mining. Regardless on your involvement in crypto, you've probably heard of the insane headlines like Bitcoin consumes more electricity than Argentina. And while that fact is very wild, it doesn't make it not true. If we scroll down here, we can see that if Bitcoin was a country, it would be one of the top 30 energy users worldwide. This large energy use, of course, comes from mining. But if you're like most people, you don't know what it means to mine Bitcoin. You may be aware that it has to do with securing the blockchain, but you likely aren't aware of the details. That is why today I will be going over Bitcoin's proof of work algorithm, the algorithm used to mine Bitcoin. I will be doing this using Python, namely in a Jupyter or Collab notebook. Their inspiration for this video came after trying to explain how mining worked to my nephew. We ended up writing a little bit of code, and after cleaning it up and adding a bit more, this is the result. I hope that this video is helpful to those who want to learn more about how exactly Bitcoin mining works. So to get started, the Bitcoin proof of work algorithm is one of the key steps taken to secure the network, along with public and private key signatures on the transactions, as well as rules that validators follow. The Bitcoin proof of work algorithm is slow to compute, but fast to verify. And that's what makes it work. Bitcoin proof of work uses the SHA-256 as its hashing algorithm. But first, let's take a look at what hashing is. Hashing is a function that maps data to a unique key. This data can be anything, whether that be a file, or in our example, a character string. In Bitcoin, it is a block full of transactions. Something to note is that in some other hashing algorithms, we have what are called collisions. This is where the hash of a data input gives the same hash as another data input. This is currently understood not to be mathematically possible with SHA-256, as it would likely take longer to happen than the universe has existed. For demonstration, Let's now hash something with SHA-256. These outputs, while not random, are impossible to predict without already having hashed them previously. So first, we'll be importing hashlib. This is an included library in Python that will allow us to hash any message we want. We have our message, in this case will be hello world, and first we must encode it. So after we encode it, we can then hash it using SHA-256 and then digest it and here we will print it out and as I said what SHA-256 does is it maps data to a unique key so what these do is that we're changing the message we're capitalizing the W and here we flipped hello world to world hello and this will demonstrate that these will generate different hash values so let's run it now and as we can see, we have three very different hash outputs. What we just hash is pretty simple. In Bitcoin, we hash blocks. Blocks contain transaction data, as well as the hash of the previous block. It also includes the timestamp, the nonce, and a few more things. For simplicity's sake, in this video, we will be just looking at the nonce, which is just a random number. At this point, let's go ahead and import the code I prepared for this video. We will go back and review it when needed. So as it's implied in the name, Bitcoin proof of work is to prove work has been done on a block. Work in this case is computational work. This computational work is done by hashing a block until a SHA-256 hash is found that meets certain requirements. In Bitcoin, one of those requirements is that the block hash is below a certain value. In other words, it is a requirement that the hash of some data lead with a certain number of zeros. This is the concept of difficulty in the blockchain, with more leading zeros requiring more hashing, or more work, to find. Let's now look at a demo. So in this code here, We'll set the difficulty to 1 and 3. In this case, this will set the thing to check to 1, 0, and this will set it to 3. So as you see, we have 1, 0, and 3, zeros. 
to find where this code works, we go up here to set difficulty, and we see that for I in range of difficulty, so how many zeros do you want? We build up a string and keep adding zeros on it until we hit the number of zeros that we said that we wanted, and then it returns it. So, as we saw previously, the hash for a string like hello world is this very long thing here. If we want to make it so the string hello world met the requirements of a certain difficulty, we're going to have to add or change some of the data. We don't want to change the message, so we're going to have to add a number called a nonce to the end of the message and hash the entire thing. We will keep hashing until we have a hash that meets the requirements. Let's first take a look at what this means though. So let's now run this. And so what this did here is that it did the same thing as above, but we add a zero to the end, a one, a two, three, a four, and then we hash the message. And we can see that as before, we're getting different outputs each time. And if we do this enough, we should get a hash that has one zero or two zeros or three zeros. And we just gotta keep hashing until we get the output that we want. Important to note with respect to Bitcoin is that the nonce can only be up to 32 bits or roughly 4 billion. If this was the only variable that could be changed, this would cause issues as there may not be a hash that exists with only 4 billion attempts, especially if the difficulty is high. However, Bitcoin contains transactions and these transactions can be in any order, meaning that the number of possible combinations with just the nonce and the transactions is n factorial times 2 to the power of 32, which while not infinite, with even only a couple dozen transactions, it might as well be. So now that we understand hashing, and we understand that Bitcoin wants to hash a block to receive a certain number of leading zeros based on that difficulty, we can now see that with higher difficulties, the time it takes to find a hash increases dramatically. So let's now see the time impact by making the difficulty higher and higher. Here we're going to run it with difficulty one all the way through seven. The arguments for this function are the message we want to hash, the process size, meaning how large of a number do we want to use before we output our results? The number of processes, in this case, we're only running on one thread, so it's one. The difficulty, which is one, and the mode to run, which is zero, and I'll explain that above. So here's the main code we'll be running. We're running mode zero, so that we can run on one core for demonstration purposes. And then here's the code we'll be running on the one core. Here we have the canner, which will act as the nonce increment. We have solution, which is the code we ran earlier to set difficulty. This is what we'll be checking later to see if we found a valid hash. Here we get the current time. This will be used to calculate the hash rate that we are experiencing. Now we're running while true, so we're running until we find a hash that meets our requirements. And here are the lines that we've gone over before. We are taking our message, adding the nonce, encoding it, and getting the hash. And then what we're doing here is we're taking the first X number of zeros, depending upon the difficulty, and we're seeing what they are. And if it's equal to the solution, then we have found a valid hash. At that point, we print out the original base message, the nonce, the hash message, the number of times we hashed, and then we break. The rest of the code in this function just deals with status updates. So if the number of nonce has passed the process size, so a million, 10 million, what have you, we get the end time and then we calculate the hash rate based upon the time that has elapsed and how many nonces we have hashed. And then we print out the hash rate and how many times we've hashed. So now that we know what the code is doing, Let's now hash hello world with different levels of difficulty and see how long it takes to find a valid hash given that difficulty.
As we can see, as we increase the difficulty, the time it took to find a valid hash rapidly increased. For a difficulty of one, almost no time at all, two, almost no time at all, and three, 1.2 milliseconds, four, 23.8 milliseconds, five, 4.28 seconds, difficulty of six is 27 seconds, and then difficulty of seven zeros was four minutes and five seconds. So as we can see, for unique data, in order to find a hash that meets the difficulty requirements, there is no way but to put in the work. Important to note though, is that once this is done, it can be checked almost instantly. Bitcoin validators receive work from miners and can quickly check the result. A valid result will be accepted and the mine block will be propagated to the network. The miner will then receive Bitcoin for this work. By using proof of work, along with a few other methods, Bitcoin can be highly secure, distributed, and an immutable network. One thing worth pointing out is that since the previous block hash is one of the inputs in a blockchain's blocks, this proof of work makes it so that one cannot change past blocks without it being detected and without redoing past work. Because if one wanted to undo a transaction that would change the values inside the block and thus change the hash. When Bitcoin first came out, the difficulty was set to nine zeros. Currently, the difficulty is typically between 17 and 19 zeros. We saw just how much more work was needed going from one to seven. You can imagine how much more work is being done now than it was when Bitcoin first came out and maybe now you have a better understanding of why Bitcoin uses such an astronomical amount of power. This also means that if you were one of the first miners mining Bitcoin you could have mined tons of Bitcoin with just a normal CPU. If you would want to know why the computational demand has gone up so much in short, it's due to the fact that SHA-256 is highly parallelizable, and I'll be going over that in a future video. So that's all for this video. I hope this video helped you learn what proof of work is for Bitcoin, as well as what difficulty is in Bitcoin and how it affects the amount of work needed to mine Bitcoin. If you liked the video, consider us leaving a like and subscribing. I plan on making more videos on blockchain, artificial intelligence, and tech in general. So if that sounds interesting to you, subscribe so you don't miss a single video. Thanks again for watching, and please have a great day.